This episode is sponsored by Kaplan Medical. If you head over to captest.com and use the offer code ITB15, you can get 15% off any Kaplan Medical product. And importantly, for AMA members, you can combine this discount with your AMA membership for a total of 40% off. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. Hey everyone, I am Patrick Beeman, your host. This is the Inside the Boards podcast. You're listening to an archived episode of our 2017 Study Smarter series this time featuring Elizabeth and Taylor Brana, whom you may have heard from the Happy Doc podcast, the voice of fulfilled physicians, today discussing some high-yield psychiatry questions. And I finally figured out how to give a free trial of our all-audio QBank to ITB podcast listeners. If you click the link in the show notes or go to insidetheboards.podbean.com, And on the right or left of the page, you'll see a premium plans link. There is one free three-day QBank trial associated with a monthly recurring plan for only 10 bucks per month. I know it's kind of annoying. It's only three days and you still have to sign up for something, but there is frankly no way right now for us to offer a trial except in this format. But please check it out. If you sign up for a 6 or 12 month subscription before August 15th, we will double the length of your subscription for free. At any rate, before we get into the content, here is another Kaplan test prep minute. All right, Dr. Samino, students uh, struggle with getting through long stems and it I, kind of the perception is that, you know, these exam items, the vignettes are getting longer and longer. Why are they so long? Or why is there that perception there? And how do exam writers deal with that? How do the USMLE writers and Comlex writers decide how long an item should be? So one of the things that they're trying to do is they're trying to present a realistic scenario. And if you think about a patient you see in the ER or in the clinic, you have a half an hour of information that you collect. And so to be fully realistic, they present you with a half hour worth of information, which obviously they can't do. Whereas if they go in the other extreme and say, well, we're just going to present the information that's key to this question, then they've avoided one of the steps necessary in medical problem solving, which is figuring out which information is key. So they're trying to find that balance of a realistic scenario that's rich with information, some of which is not pertinent to the question they want to ask. Just like um, real life. <laughs> just just like real life. But they also are mindful of trying to not become a test of reading speed and keeping with this idea that it's that it's focused on medical knowledge. So they're still struggling with solving that problem. I've seen um, at AAMC, the MBME presented one approach, which I don't think has appeared on the test yet, but instead of a, a paragraph of prose, giving a tabular medical record representation, which would be a lot quicker to read, but would still potentially present a lot of information. So that's one possibility. They've played around with changing the length of of time, amount of time, the number of items. From a student perspective, though, there's two things that students can do. One is develop a very rigorous approach to reading through questions, starting with the question itself. So if you have a long case scenario, Don't read the case scenario first. Read the question. What, you know, and the question will say, what's the best treatment or what's the most likely diagnosis or something like that. Now, when you read the case, your mind is primed to think about what information answers that question. And so you can read through it a lot faster. Sometimes, you know, they'll have an x-ray or they'll have an EKG. And frankly, you don't need to look at the x-ray or the EKG all the time to answer the question. Well, there's a second thing students should do, which is really to build up their stamina. It, you can get better and faster at this by practice. And so starting with short blocks of questions and then building up to full-length tests periodically is one way to get more efficient. And so you talk about that process of how to an approach the exam items. So read the interrogatory first, then go back, 
to the actual vignette. So your mind is primed for the information you need to exclude or include in providing an answer. The at least overall basic step I usually suggest too is do what the writers have to do, and that is apply the cover the answers test. Because each question that is, or each item vignette interrogatory couplet should be answerable without actual reference or information included in the answer choices. What do you think about that? Any thoughts? So I recommend sort of a, a hybrid approach. There is something to be gained by looking at the answer choices, not to see what the answer choices are specifically, but to see what domain they all fall within. NBME really tries to have the answer choices grouped as close together semantically as possible. So, for example, they will not ask, what's the next best step, and then present you with a test and a treatment and a, a discharge plan or something like that. They'll present you with four tests or five tests or five treatments or whatever. And, but not only that, they'll present you with five diagnostic uh, radiology tests or five uh, five uh, alpha receptor blocker treatments, something, you know, very close together in which one choice is, is the one that you're looking for. I then would not use that, the answer choices themselves as you're reading the question, but again, like the interrogatory, use it to sort of guide your process of reading the question. What, it, what kind of thing are you looking for? All right. Well, thanks. Welcome back, Boards Insiders. This is Taylor Brana. He's about to start his intern year at Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. He will be a psychiatry resident. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Taylor Brana. I have a podcast, if you don't know, it's called The Happy Dog. And essentially on this podcast, we get on um, inspirational guests, people who are doing really cool things in medicine. Specifically, it's about inspiring all the medical students and the young doctors out there, that there's many ways to practice medicine. And these people have found happiness and peace while practicing in a really demanding field. And as you guys know, you know, depression and suicide, all that stuff is pretty rampant. So I think it's important that we have something like this. So if you guys have some time, definitely, definitely check out the podcast. It's www.thehappydoc.com. And you can find all the channels on there. And I'm starting a psychiatry residency in July, and that's super exciting. Very exciting. I'm also a psychiatry resident, so I definitely agree. And today we are going to hear a little bit from Taylor about his few really high-yield, useful key concepts that he's picked up along the way as far as some, some techniques we can use to get the highest board scores possible. So did you want to give us a little run-through on those? Sure. Yeah. Um, and I actually got the chance to interview some people who did really great on boards. And um, for example, one of the guys um, I interviewed, he took both the USMLE and the Comlex exam. But on his Comlex, his score was so high that the top score is technically 800. But this guy got higher than that score. So I wow. guess statistically speaking or something, he got so many questions right in comparison to everyone else that his score was literally higher than the top score that theoretically you can get. I think it was like 840 or something. That's Anyways, incredible. point being, yeah, it was ridiculous. Yeah, so I compiled a list of, you know, the major tips from some of these people. And obviously, you guys are listening to this podcast, so I'm sure you're getting some great tips on here. So I'm just going to briefly go through some of these points. The first thing that's really important is just to know how you learn and don't lie to yourself. And what I mean by that is if you really kicked butt on one of your exams in the past, there's probably a reason why you did well on it. You probably used um, a form of studying habit that is effective for you, whether that is you're more kinesthetic and you like to write or you're more of an audio learner um, or you're more visual, you know, really utilizing those things that allow you to learn the best. If you need to explain things to a friend um, I used to, I need to explain stuff. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense to me. So I used to record myself explaining questions as I was going through it. And then later, if I wanted to, I could listen to it. You know, so there's, there's lots of ways to do that. And the other part of that, what I said was don't lie to yourself. You know, oftentimes, I think we can trick ourselves into thinking we know something when we really don't. Kind of having that self insight of knowing when you actually know something 
because sometimes you want to trick yourself and make it easier. But if you don't know the concept, review it. Try to explain it to someone. If you can't explain it, you probably don't know it. And that's okay. And be humble about it. And the other aspect to this point is to stay in your lane. I see a lot of times people are trying to compare themselves to their friends. You know, their friends like, oh, I just took my NBO me exam and I got like a 250. And and meanwhile, like you're taking these same exams, exams and you're getting a 220. You know, don't beat yourself up about comparing yourself to someone else. Fact of the matter is that's where you're at and you need to improve yourself. And, you know, some people are just better test takers or whatever, but um, you can improve yourself and work on yourself until you get those scores that you really want. Number two on this list is remembering the big picture. No matter how you feel during this process of studying, you're going to get stressed out. You're going to hate your life. It's going to be terrible. But remember, remember why you're doing this and remember that it's for a greater cause, which is for you to be a practicing physician and go into a specialty that you absolutely love. So that's really important. So remember that big picture. And as one of my guests said on the podcast, it's studying for three, four, five, six months for the rest of your life. So really put that into perspective, bust your butt now, and it's going to pay off later. And then there's a lot of other few points um, in terms of scheduling your exam. We don't really need to go through that too much. In terms of recommended resources, you guys probably know this. UWorld, Pathoma, First Aid. A lot of people use Sketchy Micro or Picmonic. And then Cram Fighters is a great tool for scheduling. Um, you want to take all the tools and figure out how much of each tool there is. So First Aid, you're going to count up all the pages. You know, for Sketchy Micro, you're going to count up all the cards that you need to use. And you're going to see how many days you have till your exam. And you want to plan in rest days. And essentially, you're going to schedule out how many questions do I need to do per day? How many pages of reading do I need to do? So you can keep yourself on track. And Cram Fighters is a great way to do that. Another big point, um, a lot of these people that I interviewed, they have a notebook with all the questions they got wrong. And they try to explain why they got that question wrong slash why is the right answer correct and conceptualize. And it's important to conceptualize bigger picture, like what is this question asking and what concept do I need to know? Because if you have the concepts, then you can apply it. If everyone's just memorizing facts all the time, yeah, you memorize facts. It's important. But if you have the concepts, it's going to be a lot more helpful. That's an oh, excellent an idea of keeping a notebook, I think, of, of mm -hmm. your thought process and where you were wrong. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And a lot of these people uh, are using that idea. And it's great, too, because it's like high yield because it's obviously things that they haven't been able to get correct. So um, it's something they should be reviewing. Another big thing, I don't think people do this, but super important is when you're studying, remove all of your distractions. I see people at the library at my school. They're on Facebook. They're on Instagram. They're on their phones. They're talking to their friends, whatever. But if you're setting up a schedule to study, just study. You're going to get into more depth in your learning. Um, you're going to be more effective. And then you can actually have a true amount of free time just to hang out with your friends or go exercise or do stuff that you love. And then just some like ending tips here. Do lots of questions, 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 questions. Explain to your support systems, your friends and your family, like this is dedicated time and it's going to be tough and that you're going to require support um, at the same time. Uh, you're going to need to protect yourself and make brown boundaries because, you know, your friends who aren't in medical school are not going to understand what you're going through. So try to explain it to them the best they can and be selfish at this time and and protect your time because it's really important. Um, and those are basically my thoughts for boards. Those are excellent. Those are some really good tips. In the same vein as what you were just discussing about questions being so important, we have some questions to go through today for behavioral sciences. All right, let's do it. All right. So our first question is, a six-year-old boy comes to the office with his mother because of behavioral problems for six months. He's been sneaking into his classroom during recess and stealing food and money from his classmates. He's also been dismissed from physical education class permanently because he regularly becomes too aggressive during sports. Examination shows he is friendly and polite. However, his pockets are filled with tongue depressors. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? The answer choices are... A, antisocial personality disorder, B, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, C, autism spectrum disorder, D, conduct disorder, or E, oppositional defiant disorder. All right, cool. So let's talk about this bigger picture wise in terms of questions. For questions in general, what I like to do is I want to look at the last line first, even though 
it was read very well. I wouldn't have read it like that. <laughs> I would go right to the question. So which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Cool. So now I know this is a question where it's a first order kind of thing. I need to look for a diagnosis. Then I'm going to quickly skim at the answer choices. All right. Antisocial personality, ADHD, autism, conduct, oppositional defiance. So those types of answers, those lead me to think that this is going to be a child question. Just looking at the answers, I know this is going to be a child question, and I know I'm looking for a diagnosis. Then, obviously, when you're on the actual exam, you can highlight portions of the question. So I'll be like, okay, cool, six-year-old, I'm going to highlight that. All right, he's having behavioral issues. And this is how I read. I actually skim. I don't read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that bites me in the butt later because I usually miss details, but I do questions fast, and then I check them over later. So, yeah, highlight six-year-old, highlight behavioral and he's having this issue for six months. Cool. Highlight that. All right. He's stealing food. He's taking money from classmates. And examination shows he is he's becoming too aggressive, shows he's friendly, and polite. However, his pockets are filled with tongue depressors. The next thing I do on questions after highlighting and getting an idea of what's going on here is I predict my answer. I don't look at the answer choices. I know that they have something to do with child psychiatric diagnoses. I predict the answer. Why do I predict the answer? Because if I can predict it before I look at the answer choices, I'm not going to get bogged down by any distractors. So I'm reading this. It's a six-year-old child. He's having behavioral issues. Cool. I think after reading this, what comes to mind is conduct disorder. Now, it could be a couple of other things, but based off of the, the stealing and all of those things, these are kind of against social norms that makes me feel like it's conduct disorder. And it's not the other one, which is antisocial, where... The diagnosis is the same diagnosis, but they have to be greater than 18 year olds. And the way I remember that is conduct disorder is a C. So I think children and then antisocial is a which is adult. And that helps me get those two um, figured out. That is excellent. So, I've never heard that mnemonic before, but I love it. That's very cool. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I remember that. So conduct is with C for children. Antisocial is a for adults. And then I look at the answer choices. OK, cool. Conduct disorder. Boom. I'm going to select it. So I would select D in this case. Now I would just double check to make sure the other ones don't make sense. So I go to A, I would mark that off because that's for adults. ADHD, maybe this child's like pretty impulsive, but conduct just fits better. So I would mark that off. Autism doesn't really feel like autism. And then oppositional defiant disorder. Oppositional defiant disorder, that would this the child would definitely stand up to teachers and get upset, but this child is doing things that are obviously against rules and breaking rules. So it fits more with conduct disorder. So I would choose D. Absolutely. So that's obviously the correct answer. The things I, I really love that you started, we're going to, we're going to try the next question. We'll, we'll actually, I'll read it in the order that you normally um, answer your questions. Does that sound okay? But yeah, sounds I, great. I really love that different approach and maybe our listeners will be able to identify that when we do this next question that they actually kind of liked that better. So I know a lot of people who do like to read just the question in the answer choice before reading the rest of the STEM. And it seems to work very well, obviously works well for you. So the big things for the listeners to pay attention to are that autism spectrum disorder is they are characterized by poor social interactions, social communication deficits, repetitive or ritualized behaviors, and very restricted interests. So mainly the poor social interactions is what you want to think about. It's more common in boys. We can think about conduct disorder versus antisocial personality disorder. I think that you did a very good job highlighting the key differences age between those two. And I love that mnemonic we already talked about. Oppositional deviant disorder, again, you would have the direct opposition to authority figures. This child's not really in constant hostile defiant behavior towards authority, rather just is kind of doing these things that are against social norms. And so that one can be kind of tricky sometimes to tell. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that you did a very good job highlighting why those other answer choices were wrong. And you definitely got to the right answer. So do you want to move on to the next question? Sure, let's do it. Okay. Which of the following is the next best step in management of this patient? And the answer choices are A, diazepam, B, physical restraints, C, diphenhydramine, D, chlordiazepoxide, E, haloperidol. Sure. And the, the STEM is a seven-year-old woman. Or do you want us to stop here and talk about what you'd be thinking at that point? Right. So next best step in management. So now I know this is a second order question. Mm -hmm. So 
I look at that, okay, next best step, meaning we, we're going to have to figure out what the diagnosis is, and then we're going to need to figure out what to do. Cool. I get it. Then I look at the answer choices, and you just read them, and I see a bunch of medications, and I see physical restraints. And another thing that tips me off, I'm not going to jump to conclusions just yet, but when you look at the answer choices really quick, diazepam and chlorodiazepoxide, there's, those are both benzos. And good test-taking strategy is if two answers are very similar, they're both probably wrong. So not even looking at the question, I could potentially rule out the benzos just mm-hmm. because they're the same class. Mm-hmm. And I haven't even seen the question yet. So Very good. All right, let's read the rest of the stem. A 70-year-old woman comes to the hospital because of pneumonia. The patient had normal mental status upon admission and throughout the course of the day. In the evening, the patient appears to be agitated with an altered mental status. She is combative with nursing staff and makes violent gestures while trying to be examined. She is making comments about a small animal being in her room. There is no history of drug or alcohol abuse. A blood glucose is obtained and is 98 milligrams per deciliter. Again, which of the following is the next best step in management of this patient? Okay, so first we figure out the diagnosis. So this is kind of like delirium versus dementia. In this case, we do have an organic cause, which is the pneumonia. So because we have pneumonia and she has altered mental mental status, she's definitely having these hallucinations in the room. This meets what we would say is delirium. It's very acute, but it's not from alcohol and the blood glucose um, is normal and all of that stuff. So then we have to look at the answer choices. In terms of the answer choices, we have the benzos that we highlighted, the physical restraints, diphenhydramine, and haloperidol. So we need to know what the kind of first-line treatment is in terms of the delirium. The one thing here is that there's the two benzos. I'd probably rule those out right away. And then I would look at physical restraints versus diphenhydramine and haloperidol. So this is kind of like you just have to know what we use, and it's either going to be benzos or it's going to be the antipsychotic. Diphenhydramine is sedative, but it wouldn't be what we'd use first. Um, And this person is having like active psychosis. And I think the major thing here that's discussed is that there's um, no history of alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. Um, If there was a history of alcohol-related issues, then Mm -hmm. we could use a benzo. But in this case, there isn't. So we would go with the antipsychotic, which would be haloperidol. Very well put. So I think you did an excellent job breaking down all those answer choices. You're correct. Diazepam and chlorodiazepoxide, we would want to avoid in the elderly because they can actually worsen this. what's going on with this patient. And and for a patient with an infection in a hospital study, setting, especially an elderly patient, when they're altered, we want to have delirium as our first on the differential, which essentially is a waxing and waning cognition um, and usually secondary to some other kind of process going on. Certainly urinary tract infections are a major cause of this in in elderly patients, but really any source of infection is going to be a big cause. Also, any metabolic abnormalities, hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, we um, ruled that out in the stem, but those would be things to consider as well. So in elderly patients, we avoid benzodiazepines in general because they um, contribute to falls and elderly patients are at greater risk for falls. They also worsen delirium, but we could use benzos in a patient, like you said, that was an acute alcohol withdrawal that could present with hallucinations, altered mental status. And this patient is not showing those signs as well as has vital signs stable. And so we don't have a very high suspicion that this patient is in an alcohol or benzo withdrawal. Additionally, diphenhydramine, an anticholinergic, and we don't like using anticholinergics either in elderly patients because that also tends to worsen confusion and and delirium. Um, Physical restraints. You may see this on your exam. It's just good to know that physical restraints have their own risks. Patients who are violent, who are put in physical restraints, will be at risk for rhabdo, especially the longer that they stay in those physical restraints. Um, Moving against the resistance of the restraints can cause um, rhabdomyolysis, and then also they can be at risk for fractures. Additionally, it can actually, it's been shown to worsen delirium in patients as well. So physical restraints is not going to be our first choice. You're right. Haldol is what we would choose. Awesome. Let's go on to the next question. We'll read this one the regular way. Yeah, it's very short. (laughs) (laughs) Our mother brought her infant to your office for a routine visit. The baby smiles at you. He also coos and is able to lift his head off the table when placed in the prone position. The age of this baby is most likely which of the following? 
A, 10 months, B, 8 months, C, 6 months, D, 2 months, or E, 4 months. Awesome. Okay. And so this is kind of like just the, you know, the normal development question in this case. And for these questions in general, um, I believe there's like really good mnemonic tools in first aid. I think those are really helpful when I was doing these questions. And there's a really great chart in general. I think all the study tools will have charts if you do the UWorld questions or, you know, any of those. So honestly, I would just memorize the chart and try to memorize specific landmarks that they might want you to know. The other thing, too, in my case with all of these questions is I used to work at a daycare center. My mom had a daycare center. So like I had a pretty good sense of what babies could do. So maybe that's an unfair advantage. So if you've just observed children in general, that'll be helpful. When you read something like this question specifically, the baby smiles at you. He also coos and is able to lift his head off the table when placed in a prone position. This isn't getting at an older child. This is definitely going to be a younger baby. And the reason why is the these functions are earlier on in development. So the baby smiles, okay, babies can smell fairly early and is able to lift head off the table when placed in a prone position. So even though I might not have the specific months in mind when I read this question, I will know that it's going to be on the younger end, probably between two or four months. I think at six months, it would probably be talking more so about, again, here, here you're hearing my thought process of predicting the answer before I look at the answers again. So at six months, it's probably going to talk more so about like being in a seated position closer to nine months. I remember that the, you know, baby is starting to walk at 12 months, you know, walking with no support and all those things. So this is going to be two or four months. And then my the difficulty I would have in this question is then differentiating those two. I look at the answers. So I'm going to mark off six. I'm going to mark off eight and I'm going to mark off 10, just knowing that this is, those are the answers. Then I might want to think a little bit more deeply. The child's prone, That's they're on their belly, they're lifting their head. At four months, I think their motor function, they're able to start to roll over. So they might highlight that. And then at six months, they can start to sit. So then I would choose, um, in this case, two months. Absolutely. And you're absolutely correct. I love the way that you worked through that. And I, I do like the fact that you drew upon your life experiences in this answering this question. The students in my class that had children seem to already know all of these things because they could remember the developmental ages of their kids when they went through these kind of things. That doesn't mean that you're out of luck if you don't have a kid. But I think the important thing to remember is that um, having a picture of each of these aged kids and what they can usually do in your head will probably be helpful as like you being able to refer back to that when you're answering mm -hmm. the exam questions. Even if you haven't worked at a daycare or been around a lot of little kids, perhaps when you're studying this, having a like two month old that you think of and then having like a two month old, a four month old, a six month old in your head that you can think of when you're trying to remember developmental milestones will be a lot easier than just memorizing the number and the list of activities they should be able to do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go through the whole developmental chart. I think that you hit most of the important key ones, but I think that you're right. First aid is a very good resource for going through the developmental milestones. I don't have much else to say about that one. <laughs> awesome. And yeah, I, I really like what you said with the images for each section. That I think that's a really solid tip. And then if you need mnemonics, I mean, literally just, you know, you can search developmental mi milestone mnemonics even online. I'm sure some great ones will pop up. That's true. So let's do another question in your, in your manner, okay? Sure. What is the likely diagnosis? That's the interrogatory. What is the likely diagnosis? Okay, so the main thing is we're going to have to determine what the diagnosis is. So it's a first order question. So we have A, alcohol withdrawal, B, hallucinogen abuse, C, middle ear lesion, D, psychotic disorder, or E, salicylate toxicity. Okay, and then so you kind of see these alcohol withdrawal, hallucinogen abuse, psychotic disorder. So that this person is going to have some sort of form of hallucination, and we're going to be probably teasing out what that is. And that just kind of clues me in on what I'm going to, I'm about to read. Okay. And then our STEM is a 24 year old male comes to the emergency department because of hallucinations after a weekend bender. The hallucinations are complex, including voices and music and do not extinguish within 48 hours of stopping the alcohol use. The patient denies use of hallucinogens and toxicology screen returns negative. Mental status examination is normal. What is the likely diagnosis? Okay. So then you look at this question, how it's described. 
the question wants you to lead, leads you to think that this is going to have to do something probably with alcohol. You know, they're talking about this bender, there's hallucinations. But then it says, do not extinguish within 48 hours of stopping the alcohol use. Now, actually, this is a question where I might get it wrong initially, because I'd probably read it fast. I'd be like, oh, we can bender, hallucinations, cool, alcohol withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, but if I looked at it more closely, they do say, and do not extinguish within 48 hours of stopping the alcohol use. So this is kind of like a timing thing. And if I remember correctly, um, alcohol abuse, you know, you're going to see the hallucinations and from the withdrawal at around 24 hours. But this is happening at 48 hours, which I think is more so where the delirium tremens starts to come in. Meanwhile, there's nothing coming up on the toxicology screen. So now mm -hmm. all of the answers with drugs, I mean, this test isn't trying to lie to you, right? So mm -hmm. anything that has to do with d drug toxicity, those answers are going to be wrong. If it's not alcohol and it's not drugs, now I'm going to think that it's probably more of an actual psychosis going on here. So then I can start to look the answer choices. And then I look, okay, well, we can keep alcohol withdrawal in the running. Hallucinogen abuse, less likely given the fact that the drug screen is negative. Middle ear lesion, I don't know, this person isn't having any symptoms like hearing loss and like any of the kind of dizziness or anything that you try to hear with you see with middle ear lesion, it doesn't really make sense in this question. Right. Um, psychotic disorder feels like the best given kind of how we've read the question. And salicylate toxicity, it doesn't come up on the drug screen. So I'm not really thinking about that as much. And also with salicylates, you're going to have other symptoms that they're not really mentioning here. Mm -hmm. um, given the case with this question, I would be in between alcohol withdrawal and psychotic disorder. But I would probably choose psychotic disorder because of that one statement they said where it did not extinguish within 48 hours of stopping the alcohol use. Okay. And your answer is certainly correct. So it is psychotic disorder. I do want to touch upon one important thing that we need to remember for boards is the difference between the psychotic disorder or brief psychotic disorder and schizophrenia as a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. In psychiatry, probably more than than most fields, the kind of temporal course of the disease is extremely important in, in making your diagnosis. And there will be a lot of questions where the only way that you're going to arrive at the right answer is if you know how long you're required to have certain symptoms before they get this diagnosis. So just like with conduct disorder versus antisocial, you have to be above age 18. With a lot of our adult disorders, if you've had it for like less than a month or less than six months, it's a different name for the diagnosis. Specifically for um, schizophrenia, we want to remember that schizophrenia can present certainly like this patient did, and this could be considered a first break for this patient. Delusions, hallucinations are common, disorganized speech, catatonic behavior, also our, our negative symptoms of schizophrenia, affective flattening, avolition, anhedonia. They're usually not very social, can even have loss of ability to speak. If these symptoms last less than a month, it's considered psychotic disorder or brief psychotic disorder and can be even stress-related. does not mean the patient will go on to develop schizophrenia. Schizophreniform disorder, if it lasts between one and six months, and for schizoaffective disorder, we want to be thinking of greater than two weeks of the hallucinations and delusions without a major mood episode. So mm -hmm. a patient who has essentially symptoms of bipolar disorder, but is also having hallucinations or delusions without it being related to their mood episodes. So those are all within the realm of kind of diagnosis of a patient with this kind of presentation. We only know this tiny little window about this patient. We have no history of them being psychotic previously. So we give them brief psychotic disorder as a diagnosis. Now, if the symptoms go greater than six months and we don't have the mood symptoms of the bipolar then the most likely diagnosis would have been schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. I also did want to mention that as far as the pathogenesis of schizophrenia, we know that it is an increase in dopamine. So you want to think of it being essentially a disease where the opposite of Parkinson's is, is happening. And for that mm -hmm. reason, our antipsychotics can have Parkinsonian effects on patients. Yeah, yeah. And one thing I wanted to add, um, just like a mnemonic tool for the listeners, mm -hmm. is for schizoaffective, I know people get tripped up on what the primary issue or disorder is, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So because the word schizo is first, the schizo or the psychotic features are the more important part with the mood destabilization. Mm -hmm. um, that's like the secondary thing. So schizo is the first word in there. And then the 
affective mean like their affect has changed from the the mood disorders. So obviously the psychotic symptoms are persistent even without those mood dysregulations. So that's kind of a way I remember that. Very good. I like that. We also can use this opportunity, I think, to talk a little more about alcohol withdrawal. So we can see hallucinations with alcohol withdrawal. Patients obviously can have seizures. And you'll remember that alcohol withdrawal is one of the few withdrawals that can be fatal, actually, is one of the worst. Mm -hmm. Um, Benzodiazepine or barbiturate withdrawal looks the same because they essentially have the same activity on the brain. And we treat alcohol withdrawal with benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines with longer half-lives like chlordiazepoxide are often preferred because we can slowly titrate those down. Um, Additionally, we would do supportive management. We would be looking for vital sign instability in these patients. So a lot of times we'll have tachycardia, may have headaches, visual hallucinations, a lot of times diaphoretic, and tremor is certainly a big sign in addition to visual hallucinations or delirium. The peak incidence is usually 6 to 24 hours after alcohol is stopped. This is different in patients who have benzodiazepine addiction. They will present with longer course of withdrawal because the half-life of benzos is, is typically longer than alcohol. So you can actually see withdrawal beginning in patients who have like a benzo addiction much later than you would in a patient who's primarily abusing alcohol. Let's do another one. Which of the following has the most similar neurotransmitter dysregulation as the one seen in this patient? And our answer choices are A, Alzheimer's disease, B, cocaine intoxication, C, obsessive compulsive disorder, D, schizophrenia, or E, Tourette disorder. This is kind of more a fact. It's more strict fact-based. You either know what neurotransmitters are ge- being affected or you don't. But it's this is kind of a second-order question in a way because it's saying which of the following has the most similar neurotransmitter dysregulation. So it's even more difficult in the fact that first you have to come to a diagnosis and then secondly after coming to that diagnosis you need to compare that with the answer choices. I mean we could dig into the answer choices before but I would probably just at this point look at the question and then um, come up with the one that's probably the most similar to in terms of the neurotransmitters uh, the the diagnosis that we come to. So I'd probably look at the STEM at this point. Okay. And our STEM reads, a 35-year-old woman comes to the office because she's been feeling down for the past few months. She's not been sleeping well and has lost 6.8 kilograms, which is 15 pounds, over the past three months because of lack of appetite. She also says that she previously enjoyed going to the movie theater and attending a book club with friends, but she doesn't want to anymore. When questioned about suicidal thoughts, she reports having occasional thoughts of hurting herself, but then says, oh, but I would never actually kill myself. Her past medical history includes seizures, but she's off medication as she has been seizure-free for a number of years. Which of the following is the most similar neurotransmitter dysregulation as the one seen in this patient? Again, our choices Mm -hmm. are A, Alzheimer's disease, B, cocaine, intoxication, C, obsessive compulsive disorder, D, schizophrenia, or E, Tourette's. Awesome. And then so when you look at this, you know, uh, question, you think about Siggy caps and what we see in depression. I mean, this person's feeling down, losing weight, lack of appetite suicidal thoughts, all these things. So if you guys don't know, Siggy Caps is kind of like the mnemonic tool for depression. So S is sleep. So we have decreased sleep. I is interest, decreased interest. G, um, the patient will feel guilty. They'll have a decrease in energy. C is concentration. So they'll have decreased concentration. A is lack of appetite or um, increased appetite in the atypical depression. P is psychomotor um, agitation. The patient will often be like sluggish and things of that nature. And then the S is suicidal ideation. And so, you know, this kind of fits in with depression. So then uh, one way I would think about this is, well, what do we use generally to treat depression? And that's the SSRIs, you know, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which, you know, now we're going to look at the answer choices. We're going to think, well, which one is more of a, ser- a serotonin thing? Honestly, when I look at this question, I might not remember that. (laughs) But what I do know is I can remember, well, what things kind of affect other neurotransmitters? And then I can rule out some answers. So with Alzheimer's, I remember like the mnemonic, I was like A for A. So it's like acetylcholine or um, cocaine. I'd probably skip that because I I wouldn't be exactly as sure. OCD, I'm also not as sure. Schizophrenia, I know that's more so like with dopamine activity, and that's why we use the antipsychotics. Tourette's is also more of a motor thing, so that makes me think of dopamine. Um, So then I would be more so between B and C. But then when I think about OCD, we often do treat it with SSRIs. 
And so with that being the case, I would then be led to think more so with obsessive compulsive disorder as opposed to um, cocaine intoxication. Absolutely correct. Can you tell us the difference between obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder? Sure, sure. So the, the personality disorder is going to be more mild. So when you think about someone with like OCPD, mm -hmm. um, they're generally like kind of they try to keep clean. They might get upset when, you know, they line up some pencils and one's like out mm -hmm. of order. I almost picture the diagnosis before I explain it. So I'm literally seeing someone as I'm explaining it, mm -hmm. someone looking in the room and getting upset about clutter right. or liking to keep things in line. OCD is the very intense mm -hmm. where they're starting to, you know, check the locks ex excessively or washing their hands excessively. I'm just going to add a little bit more. So you might know people who are very um, particular about their notes and like things to be clean and neat and think they have OCPD. However, they really wouldn't meet criteria for any personality mm -hmm. disorder if, if their actions aren't impacting their life in some negative way. The big difference between obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder is that obsessive compulsive disorder is um, ego dystonic. So patients with obsessive right. compulsive disorder don't like having it. They don't like that they have these repetitive, sometimes it's just intrusive thoughts. It doesn't have to be actions. These obsessions that cause them to to try to relieve that anxiety with some kind of compulsive behavior. Sometimes it's just thinking the thought over and over again. Sometimes it's like they have to count certain things or, you know, wash their hands seven times. Those kind of things you think of with like Monk from uh, television. But um, they don't like having this disease. Patients with obsessive compulsive personality disorder generally do think that it's okay. They think that the actions that they do are, are what's best. They think they're just very, you know, particular. A lot of times they would describe themselves as just very particular. They like things to be the way they like them. And they might spend 10 hours rewriting their notes because they don't want any eraser marks on their pages. But to them, that's the best thing that they could be doing with their time. Things mm -hmm. should be that way. So it's an egosyntonic disorder. It can be very difficult to differentiate those on the test. But if you look for a patient's dissatisfaction with, with their behavior, that'll be your easiest way to tell the difference between OCPD and OCD. And then since this question primarily uh, asked about neurotransmitters, let's talk about those. So what, for Alzheimer's disease, we know it's probably a decrease in acetylcholine. So that's the primary neurotransmitter for choice A. For choice B, cocaine actually affects the brain by blocking dopamine reuptake, it causes an increase in dopamine. People like dopamine. It makes you happy. Too much dopamine can make you psychotic. So that's why sometimes people will have symptoms of psychosis with cocaine intoxication. OCD, like you said, involves serotonin, which is also the main neurotransmitter involved in depression. That's the reason that we use SSRIs. However, norepinephrine, dopamine also have certainly roles in depression. Schizophrenia, we definitely think about dopamine, excessive dopamine. And Tourette's is also thought to result from dopamine dysregulation, but specifically in the caudate nucleus. That's why we can use antipsychotics to treat Tourette's. And the, the one tip, I guess, for me when I was thinking about how I would answer this is mm -hmm. if I didn't know what neurotransmitter was specifically affected, I could think about it the reverse way, which is what do we normally use to treat these? Mm -hmm. um, and then that would kind of lead me towards what neurotransmitter we're looking at. So as, in this case, you know, depression, SSRIs, and then obsessive compulsive disorder, we generally use SSRIs as well. So that kind of makes that question a little bit easier if you weren't sure specifically on which neurotransmitter. I think that's a good way to approach that question for sure. Do you have time for another one? Yeah. We'll do this the, the regular way so people can compare and contrast. A 28-year-old woman comes to the clinic because of trouble sleeping due to intense nightmares for the past two months. She's had no past significant medical history. She currently takes no medications. She says that she's witnessed multiple deaths of close friends and that her own life has been threatened numerous times. She feels alone and has been distancing herself from her family and friends. She continues to experience fear and negative thoughts that something bad will happen. Which of the following is the best choice of medication to prescribe? Choice mm -hmm. A, amitriptyline, B, lorazepam, C, modafinil, D, sertraline, or E, zolpidem. Okay. All right. So I'm reading this, and so this person's having trouble sleeping. Okay, so I highlight that. Um, nightmares, past two months. Again, we're thinking about timing here. That's important with these questions. 
boom, witnesses, multiple deaths of close friends, you know, and she's been threatened multiple times. Well, now I'm thinking, okay, this woman has experienced trauma. She's having difficult, difficulty sleeping. This makes me think of post-traumatic stress disorder. She continues to experience fear and negative thoughts. If they were to describe maybe moments of extreme fear where she's in a specific setting and she gets, you know, what are called like flashbacks, you know, that might, again, lead you towards, you know, PTSD. And then we have to figure out what is the best choice of medication. So we have to know what, what do we prescribe for PTSD. And then so you look at the choices. Some of the things, if I wasn't sure what medication we used, um, I might want to rule out some some things here, okay? So do I think that a TCA is really used for PTSD? I do not think so, so I'd rule that out. Benzos, I don't think that really fits with PTSD as well. Um, Modafinil, that's more for um, narcolepsy, so we'd rule that out. Zolpidem, that's going to be for sleeping. And I think like Z, I don't know, the, that medication always, Zolpidem with the mm-hmm. Z makes me think of sleep. Mm-hmm. So really, I'm left with sertraline, and that would be the medication of of choice, which is an SSRI. This is one of those questions where I think it's kind of like you do have to do a little bit of memorization in a way where you just kind of have to know that that's the medication of choice using SSRIs for Mm -hmm. um, PTSD. I don't think there's necessarily a trick to this. Um, The only trick is just knowing the medications and saying like, okay, modafinil is usually what we think of with narcolepsy and zolpidem for sleep. You know, benzos aren't first line for PTSD. So then this one's more like there's no trick. You kind of have to just know it. And so sertraline would be the one I would pick. Absolutely. You made me think of something. So we should probably address benzos in general. Lorazepam and diazepam, chlorodiazepoxide, the other benzos. For the purposes of boards, you're very unlikely to be giving those for a psychiatric disorder. You're probably going to see questions where you might give a benzo for alcohol withdrawal or seizures. That's just kind of a good rule of thumb, I think. Amitriptyline is a, a TCA, and what what's our big side effect we worry about with TCAs? Well, it's going to have the like all the anticholinergic effects. Also, really bad for um, cardiac toxicity with overdose, um, and then we have to worry about the increased risk of serotonin syndrome, also with MAOIs and TCAs. Because of the potential for overdose, giving TCAs to patients who already might be at increased risk to intentionally try to overdose for a suicide attempt, you you wouldn't want to do that. The main uh, cardiac side effect we think about with TCAs is probably the potential for arrhythmias and the potential to prolong QTC, which can Mm -hmm. lead to um, torsades, which is potentially fatal. So modafinil, you're right, is, is used to treat narcolepsy. Zolpidem is, is used to help with insomnia. And sertraline isn't one of the SSRIs. So the important part also of this question is that it could have had an answer choice that said uh, no medication or which of the following is the best choice of medication or best therapy and say one option was no medication. The reason we're using medication in this patient and we might not use it in, a, in another patient is because her symptoms have uh, lasted for the past two months. If her symptoms had lasted less than a month after the stressor, then we would call it acute stress disorder. And Mm -hmm. acute stress disorder actually doesn't need to be treated with medication. At that point, we could engage the patient in CBT, um, which this patient should also get CBT. Less than a month, you don't need medication, so you get the acute stress disorder diagnosis. They can have all the symptoms of PTSD, but again, it's that temporal kind of duration that we have to worry about. In less than a month, we get acute stress disorder. No meds are needed. Uh, With PTSD, remember they are like hypervigilant. One of the important symptoms will be avoidance of triggers, trying not to go around things that may remind them or or startle Mm -hmm. them, difficulty sleeping, certainly nightmares. And the medication that we can use to treat the nightmares is prazosin. If you'll remember, that's an alpha blocker, but we use it for nightmares and PTSD specifically. Um, but would obviously avoid it in patients who already have low blood pressure as it could make that worse. Anything else about PTSD or this question? That was a good summary, so I don't have really much else to add. Okay, so I guess that's it. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Can you just tell us again where we can go listen to your podcast? Yeah, sure. So if you guys check out um, www.thehappydoc.com, that's it's exactly how it spells. You can check out the podcast. We have some really cool guests on there. 
Excellent. So best of luck with your psychiatry residency. And thank you again so very much for, for coming on, our, on the podcast today. Uh, thank you. That was awesome. That was fun. And for those of you who stuck around to the end, thank you. I want to tell you about a kind of a fun thing we're doing. So this is going to be a fake USMLE question campaign, and we're tying it to a contest. So from now until July 15th, head over to Twitter, go to my page, at Boards Insider, look for the pinned tweet. What we're doing are fake USMLE questions. So here's an example. If Deadpool were in a USMLE question vignette, his most likely diagnosis would be A, dissociative identity disorder, B, bipolar disease, C, antisocial personality disorder, or D, other. So here are the contest rules. You want to tag the character on Twitter, for instance, Deadpool is at Deadpool movie in the question vignette, and just set it up like if the character were in a USMLE question vignette, his most likely diagnosis would be and then make a Twitter poll, pick four answer choices, and tag inside the boards, as well as Gomer Blog. That's at Boards Insider and at Gomer Blog. And then finally, use the hashtag FakeUSMLE. The most creative fake USMLE question will get a one year subscription to our All Audio Q Bank for free. We'll have fun while doing it. Maybe learn something. I don't know. It was just something that I thought would be a lot of fun. And you can also do it on other social media. I guess Reddit, Facebook, and Instagram, where on each platform we are at Inside the Boards. Or you can just send us an email to info at InsideTheBoards.com if you would like to contribute to the fake USMLE campaign. Hey, I just wanted to thank Rao Reynolds and Enter Shikari for letting us use the song The Last Garrison off their 2015 album The Mind Sweep. I chose this song, The Last Garrison, because of its obvious allusions to medicine, with lyrics like the adrenaline burst through the riverbanks, or the refrain give me morphine, the mention of that there's still air in my lungs, still blood in my veins, and what I would think is a very difficult word to work into a song lyric, the epinephrine plows through the barriers. Give me opium, give me hope. It's some good stuff. Even if it's, you know, a little hardcore for some of your tastes, like iTunes reviewer Camel1208, who said of our podcast, you guys are fantastic. I love being able to listen while I'm driving and exercising, and it's very concise. My only complaint is, the music at the beginning is absolutely terrible, all caps. Maybe pick something else or nothing at all. Well, Camel1208, thank you so much for that awesome review. We're always looking for songs with allusions to medicine, so send us an email if you have ideas. But for now, you guys are going to have to deal with the secondary reason I have this podcast, which is to evangelize the world with the types of music I love. And you know what? I'm not going to apologize for it. At any rate, check out entershikari.com, and thanks for listening.